TII, item 492, February 28th, 2020. iOS 13.4, betas 1, 2, and 3. In this episode, we talk about iOS 13.4 beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. iPad accessories rumors, Apple watches for seniors, Apple shareholder meeting, plus listener feedback, and much more all covered in depth starting after the intro. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, go away! Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. Today's episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash TII. Welcome to the show. I'm your scrub, and you are listening to the Today in iOS podcast. First, I want to thank Jeff for the music here in the background. Jeff wrote, Hi, Rob. I made this song called I Think You're Evil with my iPhone using the GarageBand app. For free downloads and more music, follow me at JeffJ6 on Twitter. Regards, Jeff J. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the music. And, folks, I will put the full song at the end of the episode. I also want to thank Ron for sending in the artwork for today's show. Ron wrote the following. Hey, Rob, I took this image on my way to work in Raleigh, North Carolina, my iPhone 6, since my work commute is where I listen to all my podcasts. I felt the image was fitting. After taking the image, I edited it in FOTOR, F-O-T-O-R, for color correction and added text. Regards, Ron Bush. Well, thanks, Ron, for sending this in. And folks, you can see the arts, this artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 492 or at Instagram.com slash Today in iOS or also at Facebook.com slash Today in iOS. If you have some artwork and or music that you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email to me at Today in iOS at gmail.com. Please make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said artwork and or music. Apple was busy in the month of February with beta updates. On February 5th, iOS and iPadOS 13.4 Beta 1 was released. With Beta 1, here are some of the new features added. Apple updated the toolbar design for mail and moved the reply icon away from the delete icon. Now when viewing an email, the reply icon is on the far right and the delete button or icon is on the far left. So tap left or tap right. Way back when iOS 13 was first being beta tested, iCloud folder sharing was announced, briefly shown, and then removed. Well, it's back with iOS 13.4 beta 1. This means you can now share a whole folder with someone else or yourself on another device slash account. Via CarPlay updates, there are new call controls plus third-party navigation controls in CarPlay. This next one is interesting. There looks to be a new API called Car Key, which appears to allow the iPhone and the Apple Watch to have the ability to lock, unlock, and more importantly, start a compatible car. What is a compatible car? Well, that is the $64,000 question, probably both figuratively and literally. Supposedly, you will also be able to share car key access to your car with family members and friends. Hey dad, can you iMessage me the car key so I can go to the store? Hmm, a little different than what we used to say when growing up. Sounds like you can add people via the wallet app or as mentioned via direct messaging. I tried to find a list of car key compatible cars, nothing so far, but the rumor mill is ripe with an end of March keynote event announcement and uh, at which time Apple is likely also to tout which car manufacturers will support this. 9to5Mac was able to find this quote which I believe is from Apple quote to use car key hold iPhone or Apple watch to reader it will work automatically without requiring face ID. You can change express mode settings in the wa- in the wallet, unquote. So I think by default, it's not express mode, but you can turn on express mode so that it won't require Face ID. One, that is nice. Two, 
don't let anyone steal your phone. Uh, when sharing car key access, you cannot do it in group messages, which, um, well, it really does need to be one-to-one, -one, which is a good thing. And when you do share it, the receiver will get a message that says, quote, vehicle owner, well, put in vehicle owner name, invited you to use their vehicle model with unlock and drive access. This allows you to use your iPhone and Apple Watch to unlock, lock the car, start the engine, and drive, unquote. So I guess now when people say new tech is leaving them behind, they can mean it literally. For those with iPads, iOS or iPad OS 13.4 Beta 1 brought with it new keyboard shortcuts in the Photos app for moving between search tabs and create albums. Plus, in full screen mode, there are also keyboard shortcuts for duplicating photos, deleting photos, and edit mode. Apple also introduced a Shazam shortcut option where you can Shazam it when creating a shortcut in the Shortcuts app. Location Services has a little update that when there is an app requesting always for location services authorization, for the first time the user device will immediately show the authorization prompt, which made me ask, how was it before and why was it not like this? Apple finally is allowing developers to bundle iOS, iPadOS apps with tvOS apps and macOS apps. So if you have a version for all those platforms, you can now bundle them into a single purchase, allowing users to enjoy the apps across all their Apple devices with a single purchase. This will be nice for both devs and users. There also seems to be a new feature for iPadOS where you can remap hardware keys on the keyboard that's connected to the iPad. And then finally, there are reports of new Memoji stickers. Okay, well, there are pictures too, so I guess it's more than reports. But I've said way more than I'd like to about Memojis. If anyone wants more info, uh, why? I mean, okay, well, wait until this thing goes Goldmaster and then you'll have all the Memoji information you ever needed or wanted, or desired. Then on February 19th, iOS and iPad OS 13.4 Beta 2 was released. First up, Apple tweaked the mail toolbar because, well, of course they did. In Beta 1, the reply icon was on the far right. Well, it has been moved towards the middle, and now the compose icon is on the far right. On the far left is, is still the delete icon, and that is next to the folder icon, which is towards the middle on the left. In Safari, the URL bar has a slight change. You can tap into the URL bar right away, even if the URL is highlighted, which you could not do in iOS, or cannot do in iOS 13.3.1. You have to have, in 13.3.1, you have to tap outside the URL, so it's deselected before you can tap on it to edit it. In the TV app, Apple updated the settings for the TV app, they added a bunch of new options for controlling downloads and streaming. You can change the option to allow for fast downloads that are lower quality or higher quality with slower downloads. And there are data server options that where you can stream up to 600 megabytes per hour. Basically, Apple is giving you options to tweak how you get the content delivered to your TV app and to keep you from going over your data cap or chewing up most of said cap. If you have unlimited unthrottled, then this is not very exciting. Of course, if you do find this exciting, you really need to find better shows to watch on your TV app. Might I suggest Picard or a Dayton Flyers game with Obi Toppin showing off his mad dunking skills? And on February 26, one week after Beta 2, Apple released iOS and iPad OS 13.4 Beta 3. One of the biggest items with Beta 3 is there seems to be evidence you can do a restore of the operating system over the air. Currently, or well up to this release, to wipe and restore a device, you needed to plug it into your computer. So why is this important? Well, there are rumors saying Apple might get rid of the Lightning and USB-C ports from its devices completely. I don't know if I buy that rumor yet. It does not look like there were any other new features, 
But going through the summary of features overall for 13.4, it looks like in beta 1 or beta 2, the Swift keyboard was updated to provide predictive input for Arabic and live conversion for Japanese to Chinese. While Apple was updating iOS and iPadOS with new betas, watchOS 6.2, beta 1, 2, and 3 uh, was updated as well as tvOS 13.4, betas 1, 2, and 3. And those were all in lockstep with the iOS and the iPadOS. watchOS 6.2 did not have a lot of new um, features. One feature that I did find that was supported uh, for is in-app purchases from the Apple Watch App Store. Of course, there is also the support for future car key uh, feature as well. tvOS 13.4 betas did not show any new features, but there was reference in code to a new Apple TV 4K device, including a new model number. So might be getting some new hardware here in March. A good month for Apple and betas, lots of activity and updates for all versions of the Apple OS's with some of the new features and code pointing to new devices and likely an Apple event in March. Again, rumors right now are putting it at the end of March, maybe the last Wednesday in March or Tuesday. It is going to be hard to talk about Apple news or tech news in general for the next few months without mentioning the COVID-19 virus or more commonly known as the coronavirus. I want to say going forward, I'm just going to say coronavirus because it's less confusing so that said, the coronavirus is reportedly wreaking havoc on Apple supply lines. And those reports have shaved $70 a share off of Apple stock in the past week plus. Again, going back to the last episode in Apple's quarterly conference call, Tim Cook mentioned the coronavirus multiple times and said it would bring uncertainty to this quarter. And that is where we are. Lots and lots of uncertainty. Apple also released updated guidance for revenue for this quarter because of the virus on February 17th. Did I mention the uncertainty thing? Which transitions us well into, well, the rumors. Because, well, rumors are all about uncertainty and speculation. And first up is that along with the new iPad Pro, which is being rumored, that's expected to be announced sometime in the first half of 2020, maybe even the end of March, Apple will introduce a brand new keyboard with it that has a trackpad built in, which leads to where and how Apple will physically position said trackpad. Hopefully, they look at their MacBook Pro and their other laptops and put the trackpad centered up below the keyboard, between the keyboard and yourself. A Maybe a flip open design from the keyboard. I have seen some third-party keyboards with trackpads that flip open on the right, and that would be horrible for all us lefties out there. Of course, part of the rumors on this is that the supply chain is being impacted and said iPad Pro and new keyboard, which might have been introduced at the end of March or were speculated originally to be introduced at the end of March, now may be pushed out to WWDC. And speaking of which... I heard some saying WWDC might be canceled as far as physically being there and go 100% online because, yep, the coronavirus. Just just a rumor. I was at a trade show uh, this week, and it had, well, it was a hot topic. I was supposed to be going to NAB in Las Vegas in late April, and there have been emails from the NAB saying they are monitoring the virus to see what actions are needed, i.e. if they need to cancel the show. All right, now back to the trackpad rumor. This makes a lot of sense. Apple really wants people to look at the iPad Pro as a laptop slash computer replacement. And as anyone that has used the iPad Pro knows, it is good, really good, but not a replacement as reaching up to the screen over and over gets tiring rather quickly. The trackpad would greatly improve the whole UI experience for the iPad Pro if, and this is a big if, if they placed a trackpad centered up below the keyboard, just like with their laptops. If you're still using one of the big wireless providers this year, 
have you asked yourself, what exactly are you paying for? Between expensive retail stores, inflated prices, and hidden fees, you're being taken advantage of because they know you'll pay. Enter Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is an MVNO on the T-Mobile backbone and provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile saves on the retail locations and overhead, then passes those savings directly to you. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just 15 bucks a month. Every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. With Mint Mobile, stop paying for unlimited data you'll never use. Choose between plans with 3, 8, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Ditch your old wireless bill and start saving with Mint Mobile. Many of you listening have an old iPhone or 3 laying around. Mint Mobile will work with iPhones going back to the iPhone 5C. Maybe you want to use this as a second line for your side business or your kids to get them on your old phone. And this offering is good for anyone in the 50 United States. And yes, that $15 comes with 3 gig of download bandwidth mentioned, and they ship you the SIM card in their plan kit to get your wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash TII. That's mintmobile.com slash TII. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash TII. Folks, do you know someone or are you someone that is age 65 plus, a U.S. resident, owns an iPhone 6S or later with iOS 12.2 or later running on it? And are you on original or are they on original traditional Medicare? And do you or they have $49 and want a new Apple Watch? Then we have some news for you. Heartline is working with Johnson & Johnson in collaboration with Apple to roll out a nationwide heart health research study. And no, this isn't a phishing scam. This one's legit. So how does this work, you ask? From the website from Heartline, quote, if eligible, you can participate in, the Heartline, in Heartline just by using the Heartline app on your phone some people will be asked to obtain and use an Apple Watch Series 5 or later throughout the study along with the Heartline iPhone app, unquote. The study is open now for enrollment. Link in the show notes, of course. Look for the link titled Apple Watch for Seniors. And if you are selected to be one of those that needs an Apple Watch, fifth generation Apple Watch, you will just have to pay $49 to get it, or they. Again, if you're 65 plus or they're 65 plus, and just look for the link in the show notes, Apple Watch for Seniors. In additional Apple news, Tim Cook at the annual shareholders meeting said, in 2021, Apple will finally open a brick and mortar Apple store in India. This required Apple to get special approval from the Indian government as they really want businesses to open with a local partner. But as Tim said, he did not think Apple would be a, quote, good partner, unquote. India is a market Apple really needs to better cultivate because up to now, sale of Apple products in India has been anemic at best. In the shareholder meeting, Tim answered a question where the person asked if Apple was working on a monitor for diabetic customers and if doing so would be a means for the company to get a return on its investment or was it to assist its users? Tim said, quote, If you're a shareholder who thinks we only do things for ROI, then you are in the wrong stock. Unquote. Love it. Tim continued, quote, When we work on making our devices accessible by the blind, I don't consider the bloody ROI. Our deep belief is that if things are good for the customer, they'll eventually be good for the company. If you look in the health area, the research studies that you've seen in heart, hearing, women's studies, none of these have an ROI on them. They just have a cost. 
And we do that because we discovered early on that the way people were conducting medical research was arcane, unquote. Long the short, Apple realizes that its strength is in the ecosystem, but not an ecosystem that is good only for the middle part of the bell curve, but rather one that is inclusive of all customers. Apple does not chase the short-term profit, or it seems even the long-term profit. They just seem to try to create an ecosystem that customers want to be part of, and business takes care of itself, or that's the way they plan for it to work. Apple sent out the following message to game devs, quote, Chinese law requires games to secure an approval number from the General Administration of Press and Publication of China. Accordingly, please provide this number to us by June 30th, 2020 for any paid games or games offering in-app purchases that you have intended to distribute in China mainland. You can enter your game's approval number and date below to learn more. View the full text of the regulation. If you have questions, contact us, unquote. This is per regulation introduced in China back in 2016 per mobile game devs that want to charge for an app or have in-app purchases where it requires them to get a license from China's censorship machine. And Apple is now saying if you are a dev and want to sell your app or have an app in-app purchases for games in China, mainland China, you have to, by the end of June, get that approval number to Apple. Now, here is where it kind of really sucks, at least for the small game devs. For them to get said license from the Chinese government, it typically means foreign game devs need to form a partnership with a Chinese firm. Basically, large dev companies will be able to do this, but smaller ones, smaller devs, likely will have a really hard time with getting that partnership which you know really just means rev share, or maybe you want to call it a kickback. I mean, I would never call it that out loud, but you might want to. And worse than that, the government in China is approving around 20 to 30 imported games per month. Let me say that again, 20 to 30 games per month, or less than one per day is getting approved. Yikes. Um, in most cases, if you are an app dev and with just a little bit of revenue in China, it's likely means giving up that revenue from the Chinese market, at least per, you know, again, giving up the app probably overall in China. Only big devs will, will this make sense. Again, bad news for the indie smaller devs. Most will likely have to just choose not to monetize in China if they want the app to be available in China. And that again, likely means that it's just not going to make the app available there. And let me reiterate this. It's about game apps that are downloaded in mainland China where you're trying to either sell it, have a purchase price up front, or you have any in-app purchases. So if you're not a game app that's for sale or with in-app purchases, then this doesn't apply to you at all. Hello, Rob. This is Justin from Pennsylvania. I wanted to get some feedback on Actually, usually I get the phones when they first come out. This time I kind of waited a little bit and tried to make my decision. I was on an iPhone 10 that I just paid off, and I decided to switch to the iPhone 11, mostly because I've been unhappy with the size of the 10 and didn't want to pay the $1,200 for the Max, which I felt was actually a little too big when I was trying it in the store. So I just want to give my impression to someone coming from, like, the OLED screen back to the LCD screen. Honestly, I didn't really notice much of a difference other than when at nighttime in bed, you'd actually get the the more blaring light, I would feel, from the, my phone with the LCD. But it's really not that noticeable once you get used to it, and you can always turn the brightness down. Overall, I'm very happy with my purchase. The nighttime pictures I can get are really remarkable. I, I can't think I can stress it enough, like, flash photos on phones are terrible. I've always turned my flash off, and there's just some photos I wasn't getting, and now that I can, that, that's a great thing. I got the red version. I wasn't as happy with the color selection this time around, the more pastel version, but the red is really nice. It's a little different than last year's, but it looks pretty similar. Overall, 
how snappy the phone feels is great. Obviously, after two and a half years with my 10, the battery life wasn't so hot on it. So obviously, I'm feeling that big upgrade there. Overall, I think the 11 is a really great upgrade, even for someone coming from an OLED screen. I really don't think, unless you're comparing them side by side, you really see that big of a difference. And everything looks great. I'm appreciating the slightly larger screen. I just, it's really the sweet spot screen size. I wish there was an OLED version in that. Maybe next time, maybe this, this come time around, maybe the 6.1 inch screen will become an OLED screen. I think that would be really nice. But the, uh, the size of the, of the 11 is really what got me there. And not only that, I actually for the first time just bought my phone outright and it was very affordable to do. I did the trade in program, which I would, highly recommend to everyone if you're doing it. They gave me a pretty good credit. They gave me $320 towards the phone, which, you know, made it a lot easier purchase to talk my wife into. <laughs> um, but overall, I really thought the purchase was solid. The 11 is a great phone, and I'd highly recommend it to anyone. Even now, I know we're kind of in between decisions, it's a great phone. I, I, don't know to, I don't know what to say. I think Apple really did a good job this time around. I know that maybe they weren't as exciting, but the battery life that you're getting out of these phones are, are great. And the iPhone 11 and the nighttime photography, I would have to say, is really is really something special. As a, I'm getting photos of my daughter in the lower light that I never got before or just looked bad before. I think that's a big win for Apple getting this nighttime photography and it being so good. I haven't done much with the wide angle. I did turn on the option to catch things outside of frame. So if I ever, if it ever happens where I get a great photo because of it, I would definitely share it because um, it seems like a really cool feature to be able to catch something outside of the frame. I think I've gone on about the phone enough. If I have any other impressions other than, Migrating to new phones, I have to say, Apple is doing a great job. It's so easy. It's so crazy. I walk in there, and a couple minutes later, my phone is like the phone I just had, and it feels the same, It's but it's still a brand-new phone. You put in your po- you just put it in your pocket walk out. I think it took me 20 minutes total, and my phone was basically ready to go and had almost everything I needed other than the few things I had to sign into. So that's another thing I don't think – I've heard too much on the show how easy it is to migrate from iPhone to iPhone. They've streamlined that process enormously. I think that's all I have to say for now, Rob. Thank you very much. I enjoy the show, and I look forward to hearing your next one. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Justin, thanks, as always, for the feedback. Folks, if you want to send us some feedback like Justin did, give us a call, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOON-DOG. Emperor of the iPhone 11, Justin, that is what I got my oldest son for Christmas. He is really enjoying it. And when it comes time to take nighttime photos, we get Henry's phone and we take photos with it because it is the best phone in the house, best camera in the house for taking pictures, especially at nighttime. All right, let's get into the email bag. Hi, Rob. Why do app developers push out so many updates every other day or so constantly? This has been a frustration for me for a long time. I see some of these updates that they push like two or three updates a week. I can't imagine any good reason why it has to be managed that way. My theory is that it is a way around actually having to debug the app because it will constantly be a different version of the app out there and it just becomes a moving target. I also think there may be something to the ratings being reset with each new update. If that's the case, they get around any criticism because it keeps getting reset. Regards, James M. Well, James, thank you for the email. And, and I think the reason why some app devs release multiple betas is I think it's closer to your first reasoning and that it's that's how they do the troubleshooting or the testing. Uh, unfortunately, when you release a version, you find out there's bugs. And the way to find out the most amount of bugs is to release it to the most amount of people. So when they're doing a full update to all current users, uh, they quickly find a bug that they didn't know and didn't find on their own, and then they have to release an update and then another update. So I don't think there's anything nefarious on this. I, I think it's just a lack of resources to fully vet and test the app on their own, and then the reliance on the masses or the crowd 
to then do the beta testing for them. So that's my theory on this. But I, I don't think it has anything to do with getting away from reviews. I think it has to do with just, hey, we found a bug. We need to fix it. Oh, found another bug. We need to fix it. And them not willing to wait for some period of time. They just get the fix out as soon as they can, which I appreciate that part when they do that. So the fewer versions of apps out there with known bugs, the better. Back to the email bag. Hey, Rob, do you know of any issues with Siri and the H-E-Y Siri with iOS 13.3.1 update? I know the phone mic works, but the H-E-Y Siri, or if I activate Siri by the side button, Siri does not hear me. Thanks, Jose. Jose, first time hearing of this. I haven't seen anyone else emailing in or writing in about having this issue with 13.3.1. If anyone is having this issue, send us an email today in iOS at gmail.com or give us a call 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog. Hey, Rob. It's Justin from Pennsylvania. I actually have a question about people that have had uh, their new iPhone 11 for longer than me. I guess my question I have is about night mode. I've noticed when I, when I have it on, it seems to always go three seconds no matter how dark it is. I was playing around with it and saw there was a way to send up to 10 seconds, and then it takes a much longer photo, it takes a longer exposure. Now, my question I have for anyone that might know is, is there a way for it to like autom- automatically decide, oh, it's really dark, let's go up to 10 seconds? Because it seems to me like that should be a feature. Um, mine just seems to always be three seconds unless I manually change it which isn't really great for when you're trying to take a picture that needs that longer exposure. I just kind of wish the phone would detect it. I'm sure, I feel like there should be a way for that to be the case. If there's something that I have in my, feet, my, my settings that is preventing that, I'd love to know the answer to that. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, I appreciate any answer I can get to the question, and have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. Justin, thanks again for calling in. And folks, if you can help Justin out, Give us a call, 206-666-6364, that's 206-MOON-DOG, or shoot an email to todayinios at gmail.com. There was a report in Bloomberg, the agency, not the presidential candidate, that says Apple is looking at possibly allowing users to set third-party apps as the default apps for mail and browsers and music apps and possibly more. This includes not just for iOS, but also for HomePod, where you could set Spotify or Amazon Music, for example, as a default music app. If these rumors are true, they likely would be announced at WWDC in June. Some of these rumors are based on complaints filed in the EU in 2019 per the lack of access to the HomePod for Spotify. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, possibly that complaint was filed by Spotify. And I went and checked. Yep, it was Spotify that complained. While the majority of users likely would never set a third-party app as the default app, Some would definitely like to, for example, a web browser with even more security than Safari or just one to sync up better with what someone uses on their PC. I wonder if Apple would allow this for podcast applications where one could make Overcast the native app and then give the better controls with the AirPods to Overcast as well. Hmm. In all, right now, there are almost 40 different apps pre-installed. Yeah, almost 40, I think it's 38 is the latest count, of pre-installed apps for iOS. I.e., These are native apps on your iOS device when you buy a brand new iOS device. The question would be how many of them would users be allowed to set as a third-party app as the default app instead of the native app? The Bloomberg article definitely hedges its bets, saying these are just discussions and no decision has been made, i.e. it could or could not happen. But again, if it does happen, they think the announcement would be at WWDC per iOS 14 new features. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. First of all, let me say thank you for sharing all you have since I started listening to your show back in 2010, I think somewhere around episode 85. I have gotten so many tips, tricks, and great advice from you and the other listeners. I'm hoping you or others may have some recommendations for an app or service without jailbreaking to allow monitoring my daughter's Snapchat account. I first heard about Snapchat from you back in 2012, I think, and kept it off our phones until we joined a new school and all the kids use it to communicate. 
my kids were being left out because they weren't on Snapchat. So I relented and allowed them to get it. That was four months ago. Now there has been some drama with potential bullying, but I can't see these communications. I am totally out of the loop. I need to be able to monitor Snapchat account so I can be a good dad and support my daughters. A quick search of the internet turns up some services such as MSPY, Flexis V, Mobile Spy, and others, all of which are expensive. For example, 100 to 150 or more per year. Any suggestions from you on how to monitor Snapchat as a parent would be greatly appreciated. Regards, Jim in Ohio. Hi, Jim. I looked a little on this one and I didn't see a good solution, but I'm again, I'm not a Snapchatter, but there are definitely folks that are. So I'm going to throw this out to the audience. If anyone has a good solution for Jim, shoot us an email today in iOS at gmail.com or call us at 206 666 6364. That's 206 Moondog. Let us know what you've used or have heard of using to monitor Snapchat for your kids. And also from email, hi Rob, I'm responding to Aaron's question about the Wi-Fi signal issue that Wi-Fi turns on all by itself. I have this issue as well. There is clearly a bug. I play a couple of games that display way too many distracting ads, so I will use my unlimited wireless data and refuse cellular data in the preferences of those games so the ads do not display. But I've noticed that when I go into a Wi-Fi zone that my iPhone remembers it automatically connects to those networks even though I've disabled Wi-Fi connection via the iOS mission control panel. Hope this helps. Regards, Paul in Bend, Oregon. Well, Paul, I would say this first off on your side. Go under settings, go to Wi-Fi, and then where it says ask to join networks, change that one to ask. Um, And then under auto join hotspot, change that to never so that you're not accidentally automatically joining any of these. So uh, that would be my recommendation for you and Paul. And then Aaron, if you haven't had those settings set up, you might want to do that as well. Hey, Rob. It's Justin from Pennsylvania. I wanted to give a a case review today because I just got an iPhone 11. The one I want to review today is is a updated iPhone 11 version of the Leafy case. I got the clear ombre, which is like semi-clear case. You can still see the color of the phone but it has, like, some ombre effect on it that you don't see it totally. It's a very nice case. I, what I love about this case is it feels really nice on your hand. They are pricey. They're $40 a case, but with free shipping. I will say if you order from their website, they will ship immediately. Like, I ordered it at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. They shipped before 6 o'clock that day. So they ship incredibly fast. They have a lifetime guarantee on their case. The big feature of the case is there's a loop on the back that fits on your hand and makes it very, basically you're not going to drop your phone. And you can, there's some fun videos of how you can flip your phone around with it and stuff. And it can be kind of a fidget spinner kind of feeling when you're flipping your phone around. But it it feels nice when you're flipping your phone out of your pocket and you immediately know that you have it right side up because of the loop will tell you what side of the phone you grabbed, which is very nice. I had one on my last iPhone 10. And I was, I liked the case, but I was unhappy with how the buttons felt. I know I've reviewed cases before, and I'm, I'm always obsessed with how clicky is the button once you put a case on it. Now, I'm very happy to report in this updated version it is a much better feeling button. It clicks nicer, they're easier to push. Especially on the new iPhone 10 series phones, like that big button you're hitting it all the time, and then to turn your phone off, you have to press and hold two buttons. It's very nice to have the click your buttons on this case. And the case is super smooth. It feels really good in the hand when you're flipping it out of your pocket. And my last case, I had it for almost the entire run of my phone, and it held up really nice. So I don't expect that will be any different this time around. So if you're going to spend $40 on a case, I really recommend the Loopy case. They do sell them in iPhone 10, I mean iPhone 11 and iPhone 11 Pro Max sizes. You can get whatever Apple phone you have. They do sell a case for it. And it's loopy case. It's very nice. I would recommend it. I've used them before. They're a very nice company. They back up their product if you ever have a problem from what I've heard. I've never had a problem, but they they have a lifetime guarantee of any of their cases. And they come in a really nice package, and you get a really nice note from them, which is 
kind of weird, kind of whatever, but hey, it's cool, you know. And you, you actually get a little bag that the case comes in. It's just a very premium case when you get it. But for $40, you feel like you are getting a very nice case. I'll give it that. So I'd highly recommend the Loopy case for anyone looking for a new case. Thank you very much, Rob. Have a great day. Hey, Rob. Justin from Pennsylvania. I just wanted to make a, a little note on my case review. I forgot to mention about wireless charging in the case. If you have, like, a fan charger, it will just totally – you won't be in, like, an easel-style charger, the ones where the phone stands up. But it is possible if you have the pad charger. They actually have a little video on their website on how you can get it to work. I find it to be semi-reliable if you use the pad. I like the fan chargers, but I would like to say to anyone that that's a deal breaker for, that that is something you have to think about with this case because it is the loop on the back that does not come off. You won't be able to wireless charge with the case on. But the case pops up very easily, very easily. I can, you can pop it up. It literally takes almost no effort to get the, the phone's very secure in the case, but it's something that I would like to say that to anyone that I do use a wireless charger at night on my bedside table and I pop it out of the case every night. It's, it, it's not a problem for me, but just to let anyone know that would be interested in the case, that that is a concern. So thank you very much, Rob. Have a great day. Justin, thanks for all the voicemail messages today. And folks, please give us a call, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOONDOG. If you have a question or if you have a case review, a product review, an accessory review, just have a review of the iPhone or an Apple product, anything that's iOS related, we would love to get it here on the show. And of course, if you don't want to call in, you can always just record it on your iOS device on the voice memos and then email it to us at todayinios at gmail.com. One last news, or should I say rumor item, and it is an iOS 14 supposed leak that shows what multitasking might, maybe, possibly could look like on an iPhone 12. There are some videos on the interwebs that could show what the app switcher and options will be in iOS 14 for iPhones. First, in settings, there is an app switcher setting, which would allow you to switch from deck switcher to grid switcher to minimum viable switcher. The grid switcher for iOS 14 would be similar or really the same as what you get in the switcher on iPadOS, where you see the full preview of multiple apps open in a grid format rather than the current deck format on the iPhone. Normally, I might skip over these rumors, but hey, CNET covered it, so who knows? Maybe it'll be real. In any case, there are videos on the interweb showing it in action, and videos are always right and legit, correct? The CNET article also had some news about possible over the ear AirPod Pro Pros? With a price of $399, CNET says this rumor comes from a possible leak at Target, which means if said rumor is true, it would be something that Apple would be announcing at their March event, not something way down the line. The $399 price is not all that shocking, as that is what some Beats over the ear headphones already cost. CNET is also talking about a new iPod Touch, possibly a 256 gig version for $400. So in summary, the March event could have the following items announced. iPhone SE 2, new iPad Pro, iPad Pro keyboard with trackpad, Apple TV 4K second gen, AirPod Pro Pros over the ear headphones, new Apple Watch bands, and new iPod Touch or at least a higher capacity iPod Touch. Wow, March event really could have a lot of new announcements. Per the date of the event, Tuesday, March 31st, is the date many seem to be going with, but one person said it could be Wednesday, March 25th, or because of the coronavirus, it could all be pushed out to closer to or during WWDC in June. Expect, if it is going to be a March event, we'll know right around when the NCAA tournament starts or right thereabouts, Apple should be sending out invites. Who do you want to win March Madness? I just want as many buzzer beaters as possible. I love a good countdown. Who do you want to win March Madness? Underdogs and more underdogs. There's nothing better than a Cinderella story come tournament time. Today's show was again brought to you by Mint Mobile. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash TII. That's mintmobile.com slash TII. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash TII. And before we go today, 
want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206-MOONDOG. Or record your feedback and email to the show at todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something someone said on this episode, or it can be a question or rant you have about something else. An app or product review, good or bad, as long as it is iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you've created on iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in. And of course, we're always looking for more music you've created on an iOS device to play on the show. It's your show and your feedback is greatly desired. Also, don't forget to check out our moderated MeWe community by going to todayinios.com slash community. When you go there, you will need to request to be added. I have a couple of questions. The first one seems to quickly weed out all the Android fanboys. I ask, which is the better OS, iOS or Android? And the Android fanboys just can't bring themselves to say iOS. They say either both or Android, and instantly they are rejected, stamped, rejected, gone. So yeah, it's nice, safe Android fanboy free zone where you can ask questions or post articles about pretty much anything Apple related. And finally, check out our TII app, which is free to you. Search for TII in the iTunes App Store. It is the best way to consume the show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released. It is fully voiceover friendly, of course. Please go right now and download the TII app or get the update. Until the next time, I'm your host, Rob, reminding you, go Flyers! The show is hosted on Lipson.com and part of the Lipson Media Network. If you are looking for podcast hosting, go to Lipson.com. That is L-I-B-S-Y-N.com for hosting for your podcast and creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can be found everywhere you listen to podcasts. That includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Overcast, Stitcher, and everywhere else you listen to audio. Thank you.